I am not aware of any contracts that I have knowingly, willingly, and voluntarily entered into Mr. Martin. Mr. Martin. any jurisdiction. Mr. Martin. Mr. Martin, yeah. do you hear me calling your name? Huh? Do you hear me calling your name? I just heard yes. Okay. I'm not certain what you're doing, but this is a pretrial and this does not go this way. So, first of all, my first issue is it looks like you refuse to have the public defender represent you. Is that what you're indicating, sir? Yes. If any attorneys think they're representing me, they're fired. I will not take no attorneys uh, because that would be giving up my right to be sovereign and to be uh, a living human. Mr. Martin, Mr. Martin, I heard you. I'm going to advise you of your rights and what you're giving up today. And then once you decide what you're going to do after I do that, we'll go from there. Clear? Yep. And welcome to Facts or Fraud. All right. The court will call the case of the state of Michigan versus Eric Martin, case number 23S00425. Originally, Duffy for the people. And um, standby counsel, uh, Assistant Public Defender Jay Bellinger um, for Mr. Eric Martin, who appears via Zoom. Mr. Martin, can you please um, unmute and state your name for the record? I am a living man. Capital E, lowercase R I C of the capital M, lowercase A R T I N family. Um, one of the people, sovereign, not the legal fiction corporate entity defendant with the name similar to mine. I'm here by special appearance to threaten duress, not willingly. Um, now, again, I object again to any attorney uh, being appointed to me, representing me, but that's something I want to ask you, Washington. Now, you said you're appointing this public defender. Are you appointing it for me, or are you appointing it for you? Or is it so just standby? I have decision on that. It's standby counsel. If you have motions to make, you need to make those at this time. Yeah, that's, well, that's how I need to, I'm seeking clarification. Is, are you appointing him against my will to have an attorney appointed for me? Yes. It's not representing you. He's standby counsel. Please make your motions. Okay, that's it. Well, that's, well, that's I was going to make the motion to dismiss him if, if you, if he's uh, appoint, if you're trying to appoint him for me, which, as I already said before, I, I will not be taking no attorneys. I'm one of the people. I'm not a, a defendant who's, yeah. So as I said before, so I'm not going to be accepting any attorneys. He's going to fraudulently assume I'm a defendant, and uh, which would then fraudulently. Uh, Give the presumption I'm under the jurisdiction of the court, which I'm not. As I said before, um, so you got five minutes to make your arguments, and you can spend them however you want to. All right, yeah. Like I said before, uh, I'm a living man. So, as the U.S. Supreme Court said in the cases I cited to you before, um, there's no jurisdiction over a living man. Corporations don't have jurisdiction over a living man without our consent. I don't consent. And it's also under, uh, there's no consent under the Declaration of Independence of 1776. Huh? There's no jurisdiction over a human without their consent. So I never consented jurisdiction, and I don't now, and I never will. Um, now I have some uh, questions, though, for the prosecutor. That's, Sir, uh, you don't get to ask questions. If you want to have a motion, you can make those. Well, I object to that. That violates my right to a due process. Uh, it's relevant to a standing argument as to the prosecutor, whether they have standing or not. I think that's relevant to move forward or not, you know. There's no standing, should move forward, but. <laughs> so what's your ruling on that? Your motion is denied as to jurisdiction and standing. Now, do you have any additional motions? I object to that because you you didn't uh, you didn't allow me to answer the questions to see whether you know whether you had a legit basis to make that ruling. Your objection is noted. Next. Okay. Um. Let's see here. They say you're going to be questioning me about the uh, some demands that made to dismiss the case anyway, right? 
I'm sorry, what? You said you're going to be addressing some demands for dismissal I made or right, sent to you, uh, to you already. You're going first to be... of all, a demand is not a proper format before a court and could be dismissed outright. However, I'm going to allow you to make your motions here. If you want to make an argument, you can do that, sir. Okay, I'll object to that. That's not true. As I mentioned before, demands, when someone has mm -hmm. the right to to some, that's what the terminology uh, demand is made. And, that, and that's the only reason why I make it. Um, motions, even though I know that's that's all you see in the court rules or whatever, traditional. Um, but that's for a request. And persons are not, or humans are not supposed to be requesting constitutional rights. You know, me exercising my unalienable right, right, Con human rights and constitutional rights, I'm supposed to be making demands. That's how I've been, you know, and that's backed up by law. And that's how I've been taught. And uh, so that's what, you know, so it, it's all right and proper. Motions are requests, you know. Um, and the defendant makes motions also, since I'm just. So you're about the end of your five minutes. Well, I objected five minutes being any time limit also. That I, I, don't, I don't care about what you're objecting to. You can make it on the record. It is noted. Now, if you have something that you want me to address, you should do that before your time is up. Putting a limit on my First Amendment right, that's unconstitutional. Sir, sure. this is, sir, please, if you want to have something to say, other than the circular talk that you're doing, you should probably do that at this time. I didn't finish. That's why I didn't mean to. No, none circular. I didn't. I didn't finish the first time. All right. Well, that's it. As to that, uh, is the court ready for the people's response? Run. I, I don't know if he's done with his motion. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm trying to uh, make. Um, well, the police. I want to question uh, the police officer who wrote the ticket. I have a relevant question to him as to self-incrimination. Um, move to dismiss um, the case based on that because he made me give, you know, my ID. Um, but I kind of, my memory was a little, it's a little, uh, I don't really remember exactly what was said. That's so I kind of need to question him to refresh a memory. But I do remember in general, though, he kind of, you know, I'm required to give my, my ID if I remember right. And I might have been arrested if I didn't give my ID, which is under threat and arrest. And, even if he didn't say that, which I don't remember, which like I said, I need to have his body cam and all that. Uh, um, I want that. I want to be able to review that um, now and also for the trial. If this goes to trial, I want the uh, video present as part of my due process right for the uh, evidence, which is my due process right, like I'm saying. Um, and because... Um, like I said, it violates, it violates my self-incrimination, all right, that I'm being made to give uh, my supposed name, government name anyways, which ain't really my name, but uh, a government name has been given, um, you know, violates self-incrimination. And then it's used against me to prosecute, so it violates self-incrimination. Um, so, uh, yeah. Move to dismiss based on that too. And like I said, if you need more evidence as to, like I said, his questions, then he needs to answer my question. I was about to send out interrogatories to him. Um, I'm about to do it here soon. Um, if you find that's necessary, unless you find it ain't necessary, I'm gonna send it out soon. So. Oh, another thing. Um, now, Mrs. Washington, I just filed a federal civil lawsuit on you um, for violating my constitutional rights during this case. So you may want to uh, consider recusing yourself. Um, I know you probably didn't get a receipt yet because I just sent it out like two days ago. So the court will be getting it if they didn't get it already beginning this week. And yeah, so Point that out.
I see your motion to recuse, that is denied. Based on what reasons? Conflict of interest is my reason. That's why um, I didn't mention that, but I thought you might kind of already figure that. But conflict of interest due to the lawsuit being filed, that's the grounds of uh, my demand for dismissal. Okay, okay. And I would like to, uh, Ms. Duffy, as the prosecutor, I'd like to notify you, you know, of the crimes being committed against me by the police officer, by, in this case, um, writing the tickets, and I request you prosecute them for this, because I'm the crime victim here in reality, you know, because I was traveling by right, which the U.S. Supreme Court said we have, as long as you're not carrying passengers probably for profit, you're not technically driving a motor vehicle. Therefore, all these charges are baseless. There's no case here. So in, so in reality, I was harassed, retaliated against for exercising my right to travel on my motorcycle, you know, and then with these charges. Okay, so they had, they had no evidence that I was carrying passenger property for profit, which is what's required. That's the definition of a motor vehicle under 18 U.S.C. section 31 subsection 6 and 10. That's when a motor vehicle is a motor vehicle. In contrast to the state law, I know what the state law says. The state law just says, oh, if something's mechanically drawn, it's a motor vehicle. Well, that state the state statute is in violation of this federal statute. Therefore, it's unconstitutional. Okay. And therefore it, it the federal statute definition of motor vehicle applies here. It overrides the state statute under Article 6 of the US Constitution, laws of the United States is supreme over state law. So therefore. I wasn't doing anything wrong. I was traveling by right on my motorcycle, as I have a right to do, without a license, without registration, without insurance. So I was all within my right under that federal statute and the U.S. Supreme Court case law uh, that uh, I cited already in the court that they sent back. But one of the main cases here is Packard versus Banton, U.S. Supreme Court case law. Okay, this is a little more specific than just saying people have a right to travel. It mentions it here specifically. Uh, and I'm going to mention right here, um, volume 44, Supreme Court Reporter, page 259. The streets belong to the public and are primarily for the use of the public in the ordinary way. Their use for the purposes of gain is special and extraordinary and generally at least may be prohibited or conditioned as the legislator deems proper. So as they're saying right there, so we do not need a license if we're not using the streets for profit, for gain. Um, I wasn't doing that. He, the police don't have no evidence of that. So he shouldn't even pull me over, stop and wrote a ticket, none of that. So I'm the crime victim. I request you prosecute him for that. And it's also a federal crime, which I'm going to be contacting the FBI about. I already tried uh, once. I got to call him back. So, yes. <clears throat> Anything else, Mr. Martin? Um, well, I'm going to see if you got my, uh, if you're going to, I would like to just reiterate my, uh, the demands for dismissal already made, or if you want to call them motions, but like I said, I like using the word demand because I want to, um, I don't agree to no unlawful presumptions that you know, you know, because I understand the legalese a little bit where you say one word and it means something else and it's presumed. And that's why I demand also that there be no legalese used in, in no stages of this case, because that's one of the fraudulent things going on in the court system. I'm going to be found a class action to stop this on a grand scale, but I know it's happening. That's why, like, for example, I use the word demand to use the word motion and it can be presumed you're a defendant. Because defendants make motion, see? So that's why it should be no legalese used here. It's fraudulent. It's wrong. It's immoral. It's pathetic. Whoever made this stuff, you know? Because it, it's, it's putting a blind, it's a blanket on a lot of people that don't know no better in the system. Um, um, something else. Now, when this Proceedings started, I, I noticed on the screen, 
It said no recordings are are allowed. Okay, now I object to that in that that violates my due process right to preserve evidence, me or anyone else. And I'm not just speaking for me, I speak for everyone else. All the people have a right to record in any public court. This is all public. U.S. Supreme Court already said this. People have the First Amendment right to record in public anywhere. And it's also a due process right to preserve evidence. Because if my rights are violated during these proceedings or any other, along with anyone else's, we have the right to record that and have that evidence to bring criminal or civil charges. So that's why that's not supposed to be popping up on a screen that video audio recordings ain't allowed. Right, thank you, sir. Ms. McDuffie. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, so I am aware of five items that have been filed by Mr. Martin, um, I think after this case began to be pending in this court. And I'll just briefly address the, um, as to the formatting of those, I did notice all of them are handwritten. He does write a date on the top of each document, but then he usually signs off with a different date on the bottom of the document. So if, if it ever comes into play that there's an issue with the timing, with respect to deadlines or anything like that, for my purposes, I'm just going by the date that it was received by the court, which is usually a third uh, date that is different from the other two. So the first document I'm aware of is titled Demand for the Return of My Motorcycle. That one uh, was received by the court July 27th, or, or yes, I believe somewhere around there. I'm, I'm sorry, the, I'm not going to really, the dates aren't really important, so I'm not going to dwell on those. Uh, just, uh, I'm just addressing these versus actually, I think, responding to them in detail. Um, defendants specifically ordered and demanded that the troopers from Michigan State Police uh, return his motorcycle in this case. That is a request to police that was filed with the court. No response appears to be required to call for from the people. So I don't have anything to say about that. Next is the motion <clears throat> that was filed for the disqualification of the judge in this case. And um, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. First and foremost, as Mr. Martin pointed out, the court rule that relates to disqualification of judges, MCR 2.003, um, speaks to the exact procedure for that. In a single judge court, and actually the challenge judge here is the chief judge, This, the challenge judge is the person who decides this motion. So I don't have any argument to make as far as that, but I would point out there is a quote included in that particular motion that challenges this court's jurisdiction. Um, and it cites a case from, what's that? Oh, yes. Penhallow versus Dome's Administrators. That's a case from 1795. And the specific quote that was cited in that case to challenge this court's jurisdiction, um, it's a paragraph or so. It begins with something about, heavens, let me see. I want to make sure I have it correctly. I don't want to, it's not really important. In as much as every government is an artificial person, a creature of the mind only, all that stuff about artificial persons. I, I think Mr. Martin already um, made some references to that. I just wanna make sure that Mr. Martin is aware that specific quote does not exist in that case whatsoever. <laughs> that quote that he used to challenge this court's jurisdiction doesn't exist anywhere at all, except for other cases where sovereign citizens have copied and pasted that non-existent case law and they've been told the same by other courts. So apparently there's like a bank um, of things to be shared amongst people making this argument, just so he knows and everybody else out there knows that does not exist. It's not a thing. It's nowhere in that case. That full text of that case can be Googled for free. You will not find that quote. The same is true of another case he cited, Keller versus Potomac Electric Power. That's from 1923. That case also does not include that quote, those words, or anything even slightly resembling that argument regarding the power he believes is lacking here due to municipal court status. But FYI, um, the Michigan District Court Act of 1968 did abolish most of the municipal courts. Four of them are left that they did allow to remain. Gross Point, Gross Point Farms, Gross Point Park, and Gross Point Woods. All of those are in Wayne County. We're in Washtenaw. So just so that Mr. Martin is aware, this is not a municipal court. It's a district court. Finally, um, as to the motion to disqualify, as I mentioned, that is for the judge to decide. But I might want to point out the manner in which he chooses to pursue that disqualification, including any comments or insults, for example, on page nine of his motion, when he says that also Washington was not, is not a real judge, but a clerk masquerading as a judge. 
Pursuing disqualification or recusal or even a federal lawsuit does not insulate you from the contempt powers of that very same court should you choose to continue escalating that type of behavior. That's just the more you know from me. (laughs) Third, next document that was filed from this court, it's titled Martin versus Mike. Plaintiff's response and object, pardon me, uh, response and objections to my return criminal complaint on Mike and the attached court letter that vaguely unfairly stated filings does not comply with MCR 6.101 and 6.102. I didn't have a a letter attached to that to refer to, but it looks like that is the court's rejection of an improper filing or format. Um, I honestly have no idea who Mike is, um, but the people of the state of Michigan are not listed as a party in that filing, so I don't really have any response to that either. I can advise, though, that um, Mr. Martin mentioned earlier and it stated here that the reference to this criminal complaint, um, because a defendant refers to himself as a plaintiff and... um, title something as a criminal complaint. It doesn't make either of those things true. So I'll direct Mr. Martin to the same court rule he actually cited in that filing, which is MCR 6.101. The prosecutor's approval or posting of security. A complaint may not be filed without a prosecutor's written approval endorsed on the complaint or attached to it, or unless security for cost is filed with the court. I just wanted to disabuse him of that notion that because he creates a criminal uh, case, I guess in his mind and on paper, it doesn't mean that that exists in reality. Um, So nothing more from that. Um, The court's rejection of an improper filing really isn't my business. So no response from opposing counsel would apply to that. The last two things that were filed before the court are two demands. The court has already mentioned demands. I'm so sorry. It's a lot of talking happening here. I got to refresh. Two demands. One demand for default judgment and another demand for summary judgment. Both of these I would have the same reaction to. Um, The demand for summary judgment, summary disposition concerns parties to a civil action and defendant is referring to civil procedure, not criminal procedure. There is no summary anything of that notion in criminal matters. Now, um, he made some references to article three of the US constitution Um, that pertains to federal courts, appointment, tenure, Supreme Court justices, federal circuit and district judges. Those are article three judges. Those are the ones nominated by the president, confirmed by the U.S. Senate. So this court is not controlled by Article Three of the U.S. Constitution. But I think he knows that because he's citing Michigan court rules to um, sustain his argument for pretty much everything else. So that doesn't change here. Um, Summary judgment is not a thing here. Default judgment. Now, that's not quite the way it works. I think he argued that because the prosecutor in court did not respond to the request to return his motorcycle for that first filing that I mentioned, that he should have a default judgment And he should automatically get what he's demanding because he didn't respond to it. Well, I'm responding right now, but um, that's not how it works either. Again, this is kind of a civil issue. Um, There are cases where there are default judgments filed, but those are civil actions. We have traffic tickets that defendants fail to appear and get a default judgment. But if that were the case, I would have a default judgment of conviction for every criminal case where defendants fail to appear. People are on bench warrant status for six to 20 years at a time. We don't I don't get automatic default convictions. So um, again, that's really not what's happening here. So those are the five things that I'm aware of. Now, finally, if it were true that as Mr. Martin stated, that federal law trumps all state law and that all state law and state courts are unconstitutional, the state court system would not exist. And the US Supreme Court would not hear cases resulting from the need to interpret state law. Mr. Martin has yet to hear, as all of us do, of state constitutions and the power of the state courts that come from those being abolished. So his reference was correct that there are people in this system who don't know any better and don't know what they're doing. I don't think present company is excluded from that. (laughs) So on that note, Mr. Martin, if you wanna continue without an attorney, you can, but I wouldn't recommend it. That's all from the people. I'm surprised you wouldn't recommend your prosecutor. uh, Anyway. Well, I think that she said so much. I took some notes, but I couldn't take notes on everything. Hard to follow along with everything else. I think it's best to, you know, same with me too. I say one thing, allow her to respond back. She says one thing, then allow me to respond that one set of, you know what I mean? Like me saying a whole bunch, and then sure saying a whole bunch because it's hard to follow along for both of us, I think, harder. At least me, uh, and, and for both, I think it's common sense. But all right, well, so. I'm going to respond now to the things I could follow along with when I took some notes. 
but I couldn't. I'm gonna need her to say again what I missed, and then I can respond one by one. Uh, okay. It's not uh, how this is gonna work, sir. That's I not think how. To understand I here, you, you. I have the right to that. What you you, you're about? not controlling this courtroom, sir. That's not how this works. Uh, as a, I'm speaking about my, what I have a right to do, I have a right to respond back. So you're going right. to get five minutes and I'm going to be done. So that is your opportunity. And after that, I'm going to make my rulings. You got so, five minutes. I'm actually setting a timer. All right. Again, I object to that again as being a uh, violation of my due process right to the First Amendment. Um, it's not supposed to be regulated by a certain time limit. My First Amendment right to say what I got to say based on an arbitrary, unfair time limit. Sir, in a minute, you're gonna you're pushing towards being in contempt of court. You got five minutes. You can make your objection, which you've done. You got five minutes. Now, please move forward. Criminal. Okay, I want to object to that, too, though, about what you said about contempt of court. Exercising the First Amendment is not contempt of court. It's no one close to that. There's no First Amendment right in this courtroom, so you're a defendant. You need to actually do what is requested of you, and I'm giving you an opportunity to make your argument. All right, as to the criminal complaints, in response to what you said about the, that MCR, the MC, uh, the refusal to act on my criminal complaints that I filed because of MCR 6.101. And now, first of all, they violated my due process right, obviously, because they didn't mention a subdivision, a subsection of that rule. There's many subsections, okay? So I'm still left in the dark and what specific subdivision, subsection it is. And all those apply to specific fact situations. So that was the first due process violation right there, just mentioning that too vaguely general. Uh, number two, but assuming it was based on uh, not paying a fee or whatever, I think like she mentioned, or getting a prosecutor's approval. Okay, if it is for that reason, those reasons are unconstitutional and therefore it's invalid. That court rule. That's why I'm going to file a class action actually on the court rule. And I'm going to get that court rule and get up out of there because it's, it's not legit. Why it's not legit? Because as I cited, in there, I'm pretty sure I cited in there. If I didn't, I have to check my papers work, my paperwork. But uh, I'm pretty sure I cited in there, or I was waiting to respond back if I didn't already. But I'm gonna say right now that it violates the court rule on, I mean the court, not the court rule, the Michigan Constitution part that says that people have the right to uh, prosecute their own cases. In Article 1, I forget the next section. Um, but I mentioned in my paper, in, in some future paperwork anyways, I know that if I didn't do it on this one, in the very first one, because I didn't know, you know, what the hell subsection I was talking about. They didn't mention it, but I know I mentioned it in some later ones sent to the uh, sent to you guys. But anyway, so yeah. So it violates that right. And also... Um, the U.S. Supreme Court case, Murdoch versus Pennsylvania. And I got the volume number, the page and all that. I think I said to you guys before in the paperwork. It says that you cannot deny someone's uh, constitution rights by trying to make them pay money for something. You know, a right's a right. Bringing something to the courts a right be heard is a right. I don't have to pay money for that. Criminal or civil case. Okay, so it violates the due process. So all that's legitimate. They're illegitimate, that is. Their arguments are using for that. Supposed to be acting on regardless of a prosecutor's approval or not. Okay, anyways, now as to her her asking who's Mike, he was the he's the manager at area towing. Um but uh she would have read it, she would it, it was in that document to explain that. So okay, anyways, as to the pen hollow, what she said about the quote about the pen hollow case, okay. Now, first, I'm going to say, regardless of the Penn Hollow case, which he said, um, the Declaration of Independence of 1776 makes it clear the government has no power over the people. They derive their power from the consent of the government anyways. That's something that's clear right in there. Okay. The consent of the government. I never consented and never will. So 
Number two. Now, her saying about the quote, I was just recently going to the law library. I'm going to need more time to respond to that. But um, I didn't have enough time to go over the Penn Hollow case. But if I remember it, I was just in the the law, law school law library recently trying to right, verify that quote. Because a lot of these quotes that I got, you know, that I'm citing in the court, some of them I have read and some of them I haven't. This Penn Hollow case, um, I'm not sure on that. I admit that. Um, I have to double check myself because, you know, a lot of, a lot of these I get online, um, YouTube, and a lot of them have been shown up to be legit because I go to law library and I double check on them, the quotes. In the Penn Hollow case, if I vaguely remember, I think I did have a problem myself finding that quote saying that exactly like that, but that's not saying it, it doesn't stand for that proposition. I'm sure it still does. I just got to go back to the law library and read it again. If I did read it, I kind of don't remember because, you know, I got a lot of stuff I'm doing, but uh, yeah, so bottom line, I got to, I got to re, uh, check up on that case. Um, so it'd be it'd be premature to rule on it yet, as to whether that penal case is illegitimate to stand for that proposition. But I know U.S. Supreme Court cases still say it because it's all based off the Declaration of Independence, you know. And you know, so there should be no doubt on that. And U.S. Supreme Court cases exist that say that that Declaration of Independence is part of federal law, United States. Supreme Court law, and it's the basis of the Constitution, so it's legit. That, as of the proposition that uh, governments have no power over a human without our consent. All right, now, as to the summary judgment that she mentioned, Chapter 2 doesn't apply. That is not true, because since there's not a summary judgment in Chapter 6 of the criminal rules, then I, I forget exactly where it mentions that, but it's in the court rules or another law. But I remember reading it, it's been a while, that they make it clear that where there's not, you know, where there's not a, a relevant or same, similar um, proceeding in, you know, chapter six, then chapter two is used for criminal cases. So that's just, that just totally, uh, it's not true. So the summary judgment, it, it does apply in criminal cases. Because there is no nothing in chapter six. Um, and regardless of that, in regards to the court rules, you got to remember court rules fall. The Constitution is the is the top dog. Anyway, that's the top law. Anyways, and due process right to have some considered and, and ruled on and denied. In my case, I mean the case dismissed because based on my constitutional rights. That's just something I have a right to anyways under the Constitution, regardless of the court rules. You know, because the court rules come at the Constitution anyways, and they don't always follow the Constitution. All right, five minutes are up. All right. Mm. Well, I got more to say, but uh, so I, I'm going to move for an extension of time on that. Based on my First Amendment right. So I got some more All to right. say. It's not, I'm sorry, Mr. You wanted to move for an extension, so I just want to be. Are we selecting a jury next week or no? It sounds like he wants to talk more. He does want to talk more, but I'm not adjourning it for that purpose. I am done with these motions. The motion in this particular case to return the motorcycle has already been addressed through the court regarding the fact that um, he, the court, doesn't do that um, any. He also filed lawsuits against individuals. Those were also rejected by this court as improper. And those, there's nothing to really address about that. It's already been decided. His motion to dismiss is denied. Despite his uh, understanding of the law, and I'm not certain which law school he went to, summary disposition does not apply to uh, criminal cases and is denied. And same is true for de default in criminal cases. That is also denied. Um, jurisdiction is with this court, as I've ruled before, and I will not be dress addressing this issue again. Um, the motion to dismiss is denied. There was one point that he did make with respect to due process that is going to compel where we go with this. He does not get to 
to question officers except for in a trial. However, he is entitled to discovery in this case. And he mentioned that he did not receive um, a copy of the video. If there is a video or if there's body cam, he's making a demand for that. And he is entitled to have a copy of any um, body cam that exists in this case and a copy of any police reports uh, that exist in this case. So uh, those matters need to, those items need to be turned over to the defendant so that he can properly prepare for any trial. Um, and trial right now is scheduled for one week, so I don't think it would give him a proper opportunity to prepare. I will remove this from the uh, trial docket for uh, this upcoming week to uh, give the, and there is one place in which criminal cases does have a demand. And that is a demand for discovery. So I think he is making that demand for discovery. And I am going to uh, require the prosecutor provide him with that. Absolutely, Your Honor. I think the issue was the, the standby counsel and him rejecting representation. So normally this is brought up to the PD's office. But since I think it's been reaffirmed today that I, I'll figure it out. We'll get it. We'll get it done somehow. What? Um... Do you have an email or are you just going to, Mr. Martin, are you requesting to have the documentation sent to you via mail or email? How do you plan to receive it, sir? Um, first of all, I'd like to refer to me as Mr. I understand that's another one of the, uh, the term Mr. is another one of the, uh, what's the words I'm looking for? I forget um, what it's called. Here all right. You can, or you would like to figure it out um, to get him that documentation. And um, I'm going to give you a new date. Legalese term. That's that's the word to look for. The mister is a legalese term that's fraudulently assuming I'm a defendant and all that. But uh, anyway, so my, yes, my um, answer, Your Honor, while you while you look for that date, I will just state on the record. Um, if Mr. Martin, Eric Martin, living man, the individual sitting here before me today speaking, if you would like discovery, I would highly suggest that you give the court an email address or some method by which we can deliver that discovery to you because I'm not trying to keep it from you, but if you don't help me to help you, I can't get it to you either. I'm going to give them my address and I'd rather do it through my uh, physical address here at the home. Um, I just wanted to object to the, the term first. That's all but before I forgot or, you know, you guys keep going on. Don't let me do it. But same address I, that's been, I've been sending the, uh, the, my demands to and all that, my paperwork. Um, Taylor City, Michigan. Whoa, 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 whoa! I'm talking over because this is this is live. You don't want everybody in the world to know your address, sir. Well, I'm not worried about it, but okay. I mean, okay. You, you know, we, we have the information. We can send it over to Ms. McDuffie if Mr. Martin would so allow. But I don't have a problem with this, so you know, you don't need to have a problem with my address. I don't care who hears my address, All right. really. have no car now no motorcycle because they took it so that's also a reason i'm going to move to uh that you should grant that they give my motorcycle back to me so i have transportation to get there <laughs> and again now remember now you said you have no power to decide on the if i remember right that's the word you use no power to give my motorcycle back but you do and not just power but an obligation under the constitution because it was took in violation of my constitution right because it's my private property. So you, not only do you, do you have the power to do it, you have the obligation because you took an oath to uphold the Constitution. They took it in violation of my Constitution right. It's my private property. Uh, like I said, under that federal statute, 18 U.S.C. 31, subsection 6 and 10. A motor sir, that, 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 sir, I'm, I'm done with that. I'm done with that type of argument. But Ms. McDuffie, um, regardless of why he's making that argument, which is not valid, why do you still have, why do the police still have that motorcycle? Is it being held for evidence or why are they holding that motorcycle? No, the vehicle was impounded as any vehicle would be when someone is pulled over for not having a valid license and or a lack of insurance. I think there was also unregistered uh, plate or registration, which is count three in this case. The vehicle, okay. um, his complaints refer to his desire to, he can go get that anytime. His his complaint is that he wants it returned to him without him having to get it nor pay for it um, for the well, most part. So that is, yeah, that's the issue. I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
That's right, because like I said, because it's my constitutional right to have my private property. I don't need to pay no money. And especially on top of that, there are excessive fees on, on that, as we know uh, towing places traditionally do, which I plan on getting a lawsuit going on, on that too. I'm going to make them stop that if I get to it. You know, they just keep running the prices up every day. It could be thousands of dollars, one thing's worth. But regardless of that, like, like, like I said, it's a constitutional right to enjoy. They should never took it because it didn't fall under the definition of a motor vehicle under that federal statute. So they shouldn't have took it from the jump. So it wasn't required for a license insurance. Article six of the US constitution makes it clear federal statutes are supreme law. The state statute is unconstitutional, not legit. It's not valid in this case. All right. And this particular case, we are done. I will see you here on December 7th, 2023 at 11 o'clock a.m., sir. All right. And so there you have it. Yep. It all worked out in the end, you think? <laughs> and thanks for hanging out with some facts or frauds. Make sure you hit the thumbs up button, you subscribed, and ring that bell for notifications so the next time you premiere video, you can live chat with everyone else. And leave a comment in the comment section. Tell me what you think. And a huge thank you to our channel members, Robert Morley, and D. Chris Kelling, Goddess of Truth, Pedro Wackamole, Drew B., Sean Oldfart, TW1960, Butcher Bird, Pat's Cats, West Side Girl Reacts, Jason Heaton, and Grendel's Rage. Now, if you're still hanging out, you're not subscribed yet, why not? Give it a try. I think you'll like it. Yeah, hit the thumbs up button, ring the bell, and leave a comment in the comment section. Tell me what you think. Till next time. I'll see you soon.